Hey, howdy hey, and welcome back to Emily's Adventures in Horrorland. Quick question, Braggart, uh, why are you sitting in my seat? Well, since you had the last video all to yourself, I thought I'd take the wheel for this one. Okay, I'm still the one doing the review though. If you say so. What are we covering? Today we're doing The Exorcist 3. Now this movie was a request from both Michael Leroy and Ross Tuoe. One is a channel that does bad creepypasta reviews, movie reviews, short films, and other such stuff, which I duly recommend. The other is an old friend of mine who writes fantasy, sci-fi, and horror. You can check out his Instagram and the Michael Leroy channel down in the description below. I also want to recommend the YouTube channel B-Side Records. It has a focus on vinyl, VHS, horror, and plenty more. And it comes to you from one of my lovely patrons. Link below as well. Now, we're going to have a bit of a history lesson here, because today's requested film is the third part of a film series that originated with The Exorcist, which I've already reviewed on this channel. The Exorcist was a 1973 supernatural horror film based on the novel of the same name by William Peter Blatty and directed by William Friedkin. This is often regarded as the king of exorcism movies. I won't even go into detail about it since everybody knows it. Then in 1977 came Exorcist II, The Heretic. Neither Friedkin nor Blatty were involved with this one. It was nice of Linda Blair to come back, with the proviso there was no more demon makeup on her part, but having seen a few clips of it, I don't know, it seems rather... strange. Telepathy machines in the context of psychiatry was a very odd choice for this so-called franchise. Audiences tended to agree, which led to this film being oft considered one of the worst of all time. Mind you, it was competing with The Exorcist, one of the best horror movies of all time, enormous critical acclaim, and amongst its fans was the real-life Zodiac Killer, who submitted a letter to the San Francisco Chronicle mentioning his adoration for the film. Basically this. I've seen The Exorcist about 167 times, and it keeps getting funnier every single time I see it! This must have stuck with Blatty, who wrote a 1983 sequel novel called Legion and gave its antagonist, the Gemini Killer, very similar qualities to the Zodiac Dude, including a horoscopy name. So we come to the third film of the trilogy, based on Legion, called The Exorcist 3. Blatty came back to write and direct, taking it in a rather different direction. This one still has demons, rest assured, but it is more of a psychological crime thriller than a true horror movie. Yep, there I go again, reviewing things that aren't horror on my Horrorland channel. Oh, but Thrillerland is right beside Horrorland. You've said so yourself. Maybe it wouldn't matter so much if I reviewed more than one film in a month. Oh, stop being such a killjoy! Yes, well, today we will be investigating this true sequel to The Exorcist to see what evils we can find. Okay. Okay. Ugh, early morning exercise. So here we are with Father Dyer, now played by Ed Flanders, who's having a long day by the looks of things. That's the same Father Dyer who read Damien Carris his last rites at the foot of these very stairs. Ooh, music! With extra... So this movie doesn't start out with the frightened awe of the first, but it does play on the nostalgia from the audience. That's always a safe bet. Meanwhile, in the nearest creepy church, a strong wind blows open the door. I was not prepared for Jesus to open his eyes. We cut back and forth between Dyer reciting some scripture, or maybe improvising, I don't know and some police doing their good work. It's 15 years ago today since Damien took a tumble down those stairs and died. The police, led by Lieutenant Kinderman, now played by George C. Scott, are investigating a case possibly involving the Gemini killer, also dead for 15 years. Hmm. lazy thing. Clean the popcorn machine or something. At the cinema, old friends Kinderman and Father Dyer watch It's a Wonderful Life and then decide to catch a meal because he has a carp problem waiting for him at home. It's too bizarre to explain. I can't stand the sight of it. Moving its gills. They get into some religiously existential talk and then the dude talks about the work of a deranged killer on a boy of only 12 years of age. Police Boys Club. His name was Thomas. The killer drove an ingot into each of his eyes and cut off his head. In place of his head was the head from a statue of Christ. All pretty interesting so far. I find it amusing that Dyer is here to cheer up Kinderman. Every year on this day he gets depressed, so I 
I try to cheer him up. And vice versa, probably, given how Dyer likely feels about the anniversary of Karras' death. Gotta go again. Today's my day to cheer up our friend Father Dyer. But then Kinderman gets into this horrific murder, and now both of them are having flashbacks as the poor waitress is trying to offer more coffee. Then another priest, not Father Dyer, gets into the confessional booth with, let's just say, a wrong'un. She bled a great deal. It's a problem that I'm working on, Father. Pazuzu? Is that you? All this bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> and the poor guy loses his life and a couple fingers. We don't get to see the other side of that screen. A fellow cop discloses the actus reus of the most recent killing. The decapitated boy was first paralyzed, tortured, and asphyxiated to death. The kid couldn't move or scream while the killer was nailing and cutting him up. He was conscious. Yes. Oh, nasty. That is one of the worst possible ways to go. Ooh, a puffin plushie. You're reading Women's Wear Daily? So what? Am I supposed to give spiritual advice in a vacuum? Is that for me? Oh, I found it the street. I thought it suited you. <laughs> one of the greatest elements of the movie, in my opinion, is the banter between Dyer and Kinderman. It doesn't feel scripted at all. Part of this is the excellent writing by Blatty, but the two actors also have natural chemistry. Right. Brother Eddie had these same stupid symptoms for years. Your brother Eddie died at the age of 30. So what? He got killed in Vietnam. There could have been some connection. This is exactly how you would expect old men who've been best friends for years to talk. Our main cop discovers that the fingerprints from the boy's killer and the priest's killer are different, which is not what they were expecting. That night, Kinderman has himself a dream. Or a vision. All passengers boarding proceed to the gate. Oh, neat imagery. Is that purgatory? How you doing, Lieutenant? I'm so sorry you were murdered, Thomas. I miss you. <laughs> yeah, must be. But wait, why is Fabio one of the angels? Life is not the amount of breath you take. It's the moment. Then take your breath away. You know, I wonder if both of us are dreaming this. No, Bill. I'm not dreaming. Oh, and I guess this means that Father Dyer is dead, eh? Oh, yep. Needless to say, his friend is quite aggrieved by the news. And so is the weather. Good old pathetic fallacy. He learns that all those cups are filled with Dyer's entire blood supply, with nary a drop or a smudge anywhere, which should be impossible. There's only the writing in his blood. On the wall. Why is it demons can never spell? Something else I adore about this film is the fact that all of the victims of the killer are kept covered with sheets. It affords them a little dignity, whereas a cheaper, more exploitative film might feel inclined to show everything. But it also leaves their dreadful conditions up to your imagination. And isn't that so much worse than seeing it? Yes. Yeah, and poor Kinderman, who had to examine his bestie's corpse for some reason. It really tells you what a ghastly sight he must have been. <sighs> Did you see anybody else coming to the room? No, I didn't. Or leaving the room? No, I didn't. Did you see anybody in the hallway? Did you see anybody in the hallway? Mrs. Clelia. You saw Mrs. Clelia walking around? No, not exactly. Not exactly! I don't think I heard a word of that. I was distracted by that housefly in the background. Nurse Allerton is maddeningly coy for no real reason, but he manages to have a quick word with one of the last patients the priest talked to, Mrs. Clelia. Would you help me, please? What about my radio? Pardon me? Aren't you gonna fix it? I'm the radio repairman, Mrs. Clelia. What's wrong with it? Dead people talking. She isn't much use either. You know, seeing all the elderly and infirm in this hospital makes me think of Dimmy's mother trapped in the hospital in the original Exorcist. I wonder if that was on purpose. Kinderman explains that the long-dead Gemini killer's M.O. of taking index fingers from his victim's right hands and carving the Gemini symbol on their left palms, along with other specific actions, fit the recent killings despite being kept from the press. 
You can see where the inspiration from the Zodiac Killer came in, yes? One more thing. The Gemini wrote letters to the newspapers bragging about his murders, and he always doubled his final L's, whatever the word, two L's, as in wonderful. We get a bit of a jump scare in the form of a woman delivering a speech to yet another father. This father, Father Ellis, thinks that the recent murders may have a demonic cause due to Father Dyer's connection to the exorcism of Reagan McNeil. He offers to talk to yet another father, Father Morning, who has a history of performing exorcisms. And here he is now. Oh no, dead birdo. Oops. And bleeding Jesus! This is impossible. The prints from Father Dyer do seem to match those of the Gemini killer. Remember, he has been dead for quite a while. Kinderman asks the patient, Mrs. Clelia, what happened in this room, but either she's delusional or pretending to be. One of the joys of getting old. That radio isn't mine. Mine is newer. Meanwhile, that man in the isolation tank, you know, the, the one you looked in on, uh, well, the, the police brought him in here 15 years ago. They, they picked him up wandering the CNO Canal. A lot of focus on these signs on the wall. Interesting. The police brought him in here 15 years ago. They picked him up wandering the CNO Canal. Why are we wasting time with this man rehearsing what he's going to say? This tells us next to nothing about a character who isn't important, and we're just going to hear him say the exact same thing to Kinderman in a minute. Did you bring Killjoy back as a puppet? What? Oh no, no, this is a new character. This is, uh, spo spoil sport. I just figured the review needed some, you know, balance. It, uh, it looks like you used tea bags for the arms there. They talk about a man in the isolation tank, glimpsed earlier, who has been there for 15 years and supposedly suffers from amnesia. Can you see where this is going? But recently he's been lashing out violently and claiming that he is in fact the Gemini killer. So nothing for it but to research the dude. You wanted to know about the man in cell 11. Oh great, we're stuck with... Oh, we're stuck with this bitch again, joy joy. Were there any signs of injuries, blood, lacerations? That would be in the fire. It is not in the file! It is not! Kinderman talks to Sergeant Atkins about his old friend Damien Karras and how he connects to all of this. He was my best friend. I loved him. Fifteen years ago, he jumped or was pushed to his death down that long flight of steps next to the car barn. I think the man in cell 11 is Damien Karras. Uh, plot twist. Before we get distracted with the contents of Cell 11, let's talk about the character of William F. Kinderman. Originally played by Lee J. Cobb, whom you may know as Jura 3 from 1957's 12 Angry Men, Kinderman is characterized as a thorough investigator and cinephile. He takes his job seriously and yet has an amiable personality that makes him hard to dislike. You could argue that he uses his avuncular nature to bond with the people he tries to question, to make them open up to him. That's possible, yeah. But he's not about to bond with Patient X here. This still feels like an interrogation. Here, Lieutenant Kinderman is played by George C. Scott, who coincidentally was also juror number three in the 1997 remake of 12 Angry Men. It has been 17 years since Reagan's possession at this point, and I think the years have not been kind to our lieutenant. I'll agree with that. In this movie, you get the impression he's been hardened by years of investigating the most disgusting crimes, including the original victims of the Gemini killer. His blood pressure must be through the roof, given how prone he is to outburst. Is everything all right in here, guys? We're fine! But, 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 this makes the audience take him more seriously. It's more likely at his age that he would be open to the mysteries of the afterlife and demonic entities. Kinderman's good friends with Father Dyer, which certainly helps, but he's also had more time to think and reflect on his experiences. He's seen the worst of humanity's scum, he's come that much closer to death himself, and he's realized there must be something going on that is greater than all of this, something that ties it all together. 
I think this is what makes him more open to demonic possession in this film than others in his profession would be inclined to be. Again with the dragon noise. Yup, there he is. It's a wonderful life. I think that about covers it. We've cracked the case, everybody. Are you Damien Karras? Ah, uh, you haven't any medical records for him, have you? Conveniently, for the plot, there are no fingerprints or hospital records for Karras to cross-reference. But, I mean, just look at him. I am the Gemini killer, James Vinneman. The Gemini is dead. No, not quite. Karras gives details of the Gemini killer's previous killings. I kill at random. That's the thrill of it. No motive. Black boy and the priests were different. I was obliged to settle the score on behalf of a friend over there on the other side. He's got friends on the other side. Whoa, Kidoki. I do that rather well. Don't you think? Yes, indeed you do. Well, why not after all? Yeah, why not indeed? Bravo! Please don't eat me. The Gemini is dead. No, I am not! I'm alive! I go on! I breathe! Look at me! And suddenly, Brad Dorif. He insists on being known again as the Gemini Killer, or else. Tell the press that I am the Gemini Lieutenant, or I will. Punish you. I do like his voice in this. Barely even sounds like him. Is it being subtly modulated, perhaps? We seem to be holding off on the music for this. For now. The closest we get in this scene is a rumbling sound like rock being moved. Yeah, the, uh, the dragon noise. I've, I've been calling it the dragon noise. As we'll find out, Pazuzu was working through the Gemini killer and then sent him to possess Father Karras. If only Kinderman was recording this confession. Only the killer would know how the blood was taken from Father Dyer, surely. Then, a three-foot catheter threaded directly into the inferior vena cava. Off comes the head without spilling one single drop of blood. Now, I call that showmanship, Lieutenant. Then, of course, no one notices pearls before sleep. <laughs> Ah, yes. Didn't Karras himself try that with Pazuzu? <laughs> Again, this seems like something Lee J. Cobb's Kinderman would never do. He's just not the type. The punch makes the Gemini killer fall asleep and turn back into Damien Karras. When I told you that the man in cell 11 fell unconscious, you said something. Really? Yes, I think you said again. Might have done. Why is this nursery bitch being so cagey? I suppose she's not being paid enough to give him what he's asking for, or maybe this is just the way the medical profession was 30 years ago. When uh, this happens, does it seem like a normal sleep? Nothing's normal about that man. His autonomic system slows to a crawl. His heartbeat, his temperature, his breathing, but his brainwave activity accelerates. Sounds demony to me. You must kind. I'm a bitch. Yeah, that too. She tells him that she too has experienced changes in his voice. He's been saying, save your servant and kill it in an uncharacteristically nice tone. The former saying, save your servant, which Kinderman finds almost immediately, without the control F function in a book of all things, comes from a rite for exorcism, indicating that Damien Karras wants to be exorcised he also digs up the Legion for We Are Many bit. Ah, Legion always was one of my favorite Red Dwarf episodes. I am no one. Many. You mean you are a gestalt entity? Not a single creature, but a combination of individuals melded together to form one? The cinematography here is pretty good. Numerous uses of the wide-angle lens, forced natural lighting, playing with shadows, shooting through grates, then a bit more subtlety in the form of blue lighting coming through this room. The nurse takes a peek and finds... Another jump scare. Humph. A few minutes later, she hears more strange noises from behind a door, so goes to take a look. 
Whoop, there it is! This extended shot is the moment that most often ends up on scariest movie moments lists for this film. Not surprising. The crash zoom is what really makes it pop, I think. She was, uh, slit down the middle. Yuck, more grisly nastiness. Then the killer stuffed her body with, uh... Stuff? Rosaries. Catholic rosaries. Look who else is dead. Did you get my message? <laughs> Ooh, you little bastard. At least Kinderman has some tech with him this time. I would have preferred a tape recorder, but a polygraph works too. There I was. So awfully dead in that electric chair. I didn't like it. And there I was, in the void, without a body. Just like Charles Lee Ray. Typecast much? The Gemini killer chose Karras' body out of revenge for Reagan slash Pazuzu's exorcism. His master's idea. The master devised this pretty little scheme as a way of getting back, of creating a stumbling block, a scandal, using the body of this saintly priest as an instrument of, well, you know, my work. This seems to be the next level up from possessing a young girl to make the world at large despair. Similar line of thinking. The main thing is the torment of your friend, Father Karras, as he watches while I rip and cut and mutilate the innocent on and on. He is inside with us. He will never get away. His pain won't end! Oh, gracious me. Was I raving? Little bit. You'll notice that Darif's face is half lit, flipping sides while Kinderman is fully lit. Stuff that 70% of horror fans won't even notice. Guaranteed. So, if Karras was only technically dead for a while, why not let his loved ones know that, you know, he's still kind of walking around? Even just to add to Karras' torment? His brain was jelly. Lack of oxygen and all that sort of thing. You understand? It was quite an effort to regenerate his puny little brain cells. It took me 15 years. Oh, took 15 years to bring his brain back to life. I see. Oh, let's all feel sorry for Mr. Demon, who had to work so hard. Oh, poor demon face. Emperor helped you? Yes, of course. He brought you to me. I told him that if he failed to convince you to come to me, that he would suffer in unspeakable ways. This film has a lot of explaining to do. And I don't mean it's in trouble, like, it's got explaining to do. I mean, it's a lot of talking, it's quite heavy, and it might be hard for certain viewers to keep up. It's the kind of plot that would be hard to take in casually and quite incomprehensible without the Gemini Killer's extensive explanations. Bill, help me. Damien. No! Little Jack Horner. Child's play, Lieutenant. Oh, oh, he said child's play! And Mrs. Clelia is walking on the ceiling like a goddamn spider. Spider walk? Call back to the original, maybe? Hmm? And another death. Kinderman figures out that trouble is headed to his house, so he gets his police buddies to step on it. Sure enough, Pazuzu has piloted one of the elderly dementia patients disguised as a nurse with the intent to harm his family. I've been waiting for you, Lieutenant. I wanted you to see this. What? What the fuck is that? I guess because Karis is inside with us, he can fight back a bit. Meanwhile, Father Morning enters night. Come in, Father Morning. Enter night. In an effort to exercise the Gemini killer, and those contact lenses are almost as fabulous as Christopher Lee's in Horror of Dracula. 
Multiple voices complaining. Snakes. Lots of snakes. Cobras. He who flung you from heaven to the depths of hell. Oh, Damien doesn't look good. Human rage. Fucking what? This is way more hardcore than the green slime. This is why normally the priests who exercise do it in twos, eh? And weren't we praising this film for its restraint when it came to showing the killer's victims? I'm sure a big chunk of the budget was just the gore effects for this scene. I believe. I believe in death. I believe in disease and torture and anger and hate. I believe in pain. I believe in cruelty and in every crawling, putrid thing, every possible ugliness and corruption, you son of a bitch! You know, it's so hard to decide which version of Kinderman is my favourite. The older one is more likeable, but I doubt he could have pulled off this kind of speech. The floor is very slowly destroyed, just in time for Kinderman to fall into it. That's horrifying. A little excessive, if anything. Harris finally regains control, long enough to be shot and killed. And that is the closest we get to our happy ending. This is now the second time that Damien Karras has given his mind and body in order to get rid of a demon. Let's hope it's the last. He, uh, he deserves a break. And that was The Exorcist 3, the stunning true sequel to The Exorcist with a very different take on the horrors of possession. I think the change in tone was a necessary one, being less about the power of faith and more of a crime mystery with supernatural elements. Points in the story where exposition becomes necessary are also the most gripping and memorable as we get a dark insight into the methods of the Gemini killer. Brad Dourif is gloriously wicked and grandiose, and Jason Miller does an excellent job at portraying someone who is so different from Father Damien Karras. That's the same guy, but you don't see Damien Karras when the Gemini is possessing him. Yeah, it's called acting. I will counter that by saying this movie isn't for everyone. If you're looking for more of a straight horror, it falls a bit short, and sometimes it can be slightly too wacky and you struggle to suspend your disbelief. I also found out that the exorcism at the very end was sort of tacked on at the insistence of movie execs, so if not for that, it could have been a very different movie. I can see why The Exorcist 3 has mixed reviews. It works very well for what it is, but it can't quite live up to the original Exorcist. For those reasons, I give this film 7 jam sandwiches out of 10. Well, <laughs> you already know what I give it. And what about you, spoil sport? What's your score? I am not going to dignify that condescension with a response. Huh. I'm a ventriloquist. Who knew? Okay, so the next horrific live stream may be a little while, but you guys seem to like the horror shorts showcase, so I'll be doing another one of those soon. Or two, for the different time zones. Um, go ahead and let me know in the comments, and if you've got a movie request for me, then you can also let me know. Yes, we just updated our request list. Look how long it is. Maybe if I were allowed to review movies on my own, we'd get through them a lot faster. But Braggit... <sighs> Braggit, you think every film is the best film you've ever seen in your life. It just wouldn't work. Well, we shall let our adoring public make up their minds about that. <sighs> well... As always, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Cheerio. How's the road?